This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether it's your new profession or just a lifelong passion, start your journey to website glory with Squarespace. Check out their amazing all-in-one platform through the link in the description below. I'll tell you more about them in just a little bit. For now, today's video. Before satellite surveillance, the superpowers needed to spy on each other during this little conflict known as the Cold War. What was required was a way of spying on the enemy at a distance, not just to take photographs, but to gather as much data as possible and then get the hell out of there. The answer to this need for espionage was spy planes. You may know of the heavy hitters like the U-2 or the Blackbird, but what are the giants? That's what we're looking at on today's mega projects, a relic from the Cold War that's still used in combat missions today. This is the Boeing RC-135, the giant spy plane. At the beginning of the 1960s, the Cold War was in full swing, with each side making strides into the best ways of ensuring that they could destroy one another if there was ever a need to. Spying was the main aspect of this conflict, and the US needed to know what the Soviets were up to. Not by deploying spies on the ground, no, no, no. They would do it in the sky. Aerial intelligence gathering wasn't a new concept, but during the Cold War, it became an invaluable resource. With leaps and bounds in aviation technology on both sides of the Iron Curtain, new high-speed spy planes were developed, but their job was to take pictures and run a paparazzi of aerial espionage. This was brilliant at seeing if a new base had been built or if troops had been deployed to a different area. However, there were drawbacks to aerial photography. Pictures provided what was happening on the ground, but what the US defense chiefs wanted were more details on the Soviets' developments. The only way to do that was to have a vehicle outfitted with equipment that could look deeper than what could be seen with the naked eye. For this task, a support vehicle would be required, equipped with an array of sensors capable of analyzing electromagnetic frequencies, radar data, and radio communications in order to provide meticulous intelligence on places of interest. The US Air Force already had a large reconnaissance plane, but the aging Boeing B-50 Superfortress needed replacing if they were going to keep up in this new era of warfare. Propeller-driven beasts of the sky had to make way for jet-powered Goliaths. For the design of this new aircraft, the Air Force approached Boeing again to design their new plane. Instead of starting from scratch, Boeing already had a plane in development, the 73680 prototype that they'd hoped would take the commercial aviation sector by storm. With its new swept wing design and discreet nacelles, this sleek airframe may have looked the part, but airlines were pretty unimpressed. They stated that the cabin width, which was too narrow to get six abreast seating, was their main concern. In it being unsuitable for commercial purposes. Luckily for Boeing, though, this airframe could be adapted to the Air Force's needs and they repurposed the prototype. Additionally, the 36780 was adapted to form the basis of the C-135 Stratolifter as well. With a length of 135 feet, 41 meters, and sitting at a height of 42 feet, 13 meters, with a wingspan covering 131 feet or 40 meters, this was a monster plane that could pack something more devastating than just bombs. It would pack technology. Powered by four CFM International F-108 CF-201 turbofan engines, that's a mouthful with a maximum airspeed of 470 knots, that's 541 miles per hour, and a range of around 3,900 miles, 6,500 kilometers. With this power under its wings, this gave the RC-135 a maximum payload of 146 tons. Also, the RC-135 is capable of reaching a service ceiling of 50,000 feet. This meant that the plane could cruise higher than commercial airliners and go longer undetected by the enemy. Crewed by two pilots and a navigator, there was enough room inside the plane to accommodate 27 crew consisting of intelligence gathering specialists, system operators, in-flight maintenance technicians, and airborne linguists, all depending on what the mission was. The interior of the RC-135 it resembles more a traditional office setting rather than the inside of a military vehicle. The interior of the RC-135 is fully customizable to suit any particular mission. In 1961, the first RC-135s were delivered in order to replace the Boeing RB-50 Superfortress to the US Air Force. Originally, nine were ordered, but due to setbacks in production, only four were delivered. These planes were designed just for aerial surveillance, with a camera fitted in the aft section where an additional fuel tank would usually be. Now that the US Air Force had their new plane, it needed a new home. The RC-135 fleet is permanently based at Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska. 
Originally, all RC-135s were operated by Strategic Air Command. However, since 1992, they've been assigned to Air Combat Command. This unit provides worldwide reconnaissance and real-time intelligence to the US military. All right, we'll get back to today's video in but a second. But now I want to tell you about today's glorious sponsor Squarespace. This is the age of creation. People aren't just browsing the internet anymore. People are like me. You're out there. You're like, I can add something to that. I can make something cool. And if you want to make a cool website, well, Squarespace, my friends, that is the place to do it. Look, I don't know what you want to do. Maybe you want to do a blog. Even if you want to do a YouTube channel, it makes sense to have a website. I I've got a website which complements all my youtube -y stuff. It's uh, just something that you should do. Or a podcast. You can even do stores if you want to sell something online, whether that's like a physical product, some sort of genius widget that you've created, or I don't know, something digital. You can do it with Squarespace. It's all very easy. Also with Squarespace, I've said this a million times, if you go in there and you don't have any design skills, you can still have a great looking website. I have no design skills. I've said this before. I am an absolute incompetent when it comes to making things look nice. I had to have this this background. It looks okay. I had to have someone help me with this because I can't do it myself. But if you do have design skills, if you can make things look nice, Squarespace is also incredibly customizable so that you can make it look nice if you are capable of that. What are we talking about? Oh yeah, Squarespace has also got loads of extra features, email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 20 commercial options, 24/7 customer support. Everything you want is in one easy to use place. So, go to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch your new site, go to squarespace.com/megaprojects and you'll get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Brilliant. And now Back to today's video. Much like JP Morgan, the RC-135's most distinguishing feature is its nose. Protruding out of the front and catching the attention of onlookers, this is the feature that all RC-135's have in common. The radome, also known as the hog nose in the front section of the aircraft, houses all of the area's sensitive sensors and instruments. The hog nose may be a common feature, but each variant of the RC-135 contains different components. For example, the rivet ball variant's radome comprises an S-band receiver antenna with 10 large, optically flat quartz windows to track cameras, along with a plexiglass dome fitted in the center of the top fuselage for manual position tracking. From here, the information is relayed to the computers and analysts in the fuselage. Heading down from the nose is a distinctive bulge cheek fairing on the forward fuselage. These contain additional mission equipment accompanied by several antennas along the fuselage. The history of the RC-135 is a complicated one. The designation of RC-35 is given to the family of planes rather than a specific model. This has led to there being over 32 airframes with 14 different variants of the RC-135. Currently, 22 planes are in the US Air Force inventory, consisting of the RC-135, S, U, V, or W variants. And we don't have time to cover each one because you don't want to be here all day and we don't want to lose our sanity. But here is a small sample of the most interesting ones. The genesis of the line was delivered to the Air Force in 1961. This was just a proof of concept model. The RC-135A was just used for photographic reconnaissance entering service in the mid-1960s, followed by the first of the electronics intelligence gatherers, the RC-135B. The best known variant is the RC-135V W the rivet joint. Acting as an airborne signals intelligence or signet platform, its sensor suite allows the mission crew to detect, identify, and then geolocate signals throughout the electromagnetic spectrum. The crew can forward the gathered information in a variety of formats to a wide range of users via rivet jet's extensive communication suite. The Cobra Draw variant was the first of the RC-135s to feature the prominent rad and where the hog nose got its name. The RC-135S or the Cobra Ball variant was customized to be a rapidly deployable aircraft that carries the Joint Chiefs of Staff for missions of national priority and to collect optical and electronic data on ballistics targets. The RC-135X Cobra I was a telemetry and missile range instrumentation aircraft. A single airframe was converted to the standard from a C-135B during the late 1980s. Its mission was to track re-entry of intercontinental ballistic missiles. This is just a small pool of what the RC-135 is capable of in and out of combat zones.
Due to the RC-135's long lifespan from the beginning of its service with Cold War operations, it has been involved in active combat missions in every armed conflict that the US has been in since then. The first time RC-135s were used in a combat zone was supporting operations during the Vietnam War. Since then, the RC-135s have maintained a constant presence in the ever-changing theater of war. On the 9th of August 2010, the River Joint Program recognized its 20th anniversary of continuous service in the United States Central Command, dating back to the beginning of the first Gulf War. This represents the longest unbroken presence of any aircraft in the U.S. Air Force inventory. During this time, the RC-135s have flown over 8,000 combat missions supporting air and ground forces of operations Desert Storm, Desert Shield, Northern Watch, Southern Watch, Iraqi Freedom, and Enduring Freedom. This plane may not carry any traditional weaponry, but it does offer something else. Information. All the sensors and computers on board this plane mean that combat zones can be assessed and analyzed for threats. The ability to not just observe the front line, but also provide near real time details on aircraft deployment, troop movements, communications, and how an enemy is equipped is invaluable information that this plane was just designed to gather. Despite being a workhorse for the US Strategic Air Commands, the RC-135 has not suffered the fate that many aircraft do while out on operational missions. Being in the line of fire and engaging in deadly dogfights is just not what this plane was designed for. Like we said, it's more like an office. Instances when an RC-135 has crashed have often been down to pilot error, bad weather, or instrument failure. An RC-135, the Rivet Amber, on June 5, 1969, departed Shimya Air Force Base in Alaska to Ilsen Air Force Base in the same state for just some routine maintenance. Forty minutes into the flight, radio communication was intercepted in Alaska, reporting a potential emergency. Transcripts from the radio communication mentioned vibrations in flight and the pilot ordering the crew to use the oxygen masks. After almost an hour without any message, there was just silence. An hour and a half passed from takeoff to the last known communication. After River Tambor failed to check in on schedule, Colonel Leslie W. Brockwell, the 6th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing Commander, initiated a search and rescue operation. Aircraft and crews from the 6th SRW combed the waters between Shemya AFB to the Alaskan mainland. The search aircraft flew as low as 300 feet above the water, looking for anything to indicate the River Tambor. Stranded crew members, aircraft debris, oil slicks on the surface, life rafts, even parachutes. The search continued for almost two weeks, with nothing found. The aircraft simply vanished. It's presumed it was lost somewhere in the Bering Sea, and her disappearance remains a mystery to this day. Another puzzling incident was when an RC-135 wasn't in a combat operation, but was somewhat involved in a commercial airliner being shot down. On September 1, 1983, during a surveillance mission off the coast of the Soviet Union, an RC-135 was gathering intelligence on a location of interest. While gathering this data, the pilot of the plane strayed into the route of Korean Airlines Flight 007. This RC-135 got so close to the Korean flight that it almost collided with it. However, disaster was avoided and both planes carried on cruising the skies. However, two hours later, the Korean Airlines flight had strayed into Soviet airspace. Fighters were quickly scrambled, and a combination of negligence and pilot error led to the Korean plane being shot down. During the investigation, the Soviet government cited that the pilots of the fighters thought they were targeting a US plane because of the similarity the RC-135 shared with a commercial Boeing 737 airliner. These claims made by the Soviet Union were dismissed by the US government, and the tragic events of that day remain unsolved. Two years later, there was another tragic incident that befell the RC-135. On February 25, 1985, a rivet dandy variant operating out of Valdez Municipal Airport in Alaska was on maneuvers when it encountered trouble. This speedlight model was designed just for flight training and not for operational use. Essentially, it was a tanker with modifications to the engines allowing pilots to practice landing and aerial refueling. During the first two approaches to the runway, nothing was out of the ordinary, just a routine training exercise. However, on the third, something went wrong. Reports suggest the pilots and navigators became disoriented, while the microwave landing system told the crew to begin landing some four miles, that's six and a half kilometers, north of the advised course. At 10.41 a.m., radio contact was lost with the plane. No emergency beacon rang out, only silence across the airwaves. The RC-135 had crashed into the side of a mountain, killing all three crew members. The search and rescue attempt was mounted after the accident, but the wreckage wasn't recovered until the 2nd of August. Later, it was found that the crew were following the flight plan certified for the de Havilland Canada DHC-7 short takeoff and landing or STOL aeroplane. The glide slope and approach for this aircraft are significantly steeper than those for an RC-135 jet. After this accident, more stringent safety measures were put into place and incidents involving the RC-135 are now few and far between.
With advancements in satellite surveillance technology, it's almost staggering that this plane is still in service. Not only that, but it has caught the attention of other nations for their defense as well. Due to the success of the plane on the 22nd of March 2010, the British Ministry of Defense announced that it had reached an agreement with the US to purchase three RC-135W Ribbit Joint aircraft to replace its Nimrod R-1. A further deal in 2018 between the US and the British Ministry of Defense secured a contract for the continual use of the RC-135 until at least 2045. While most of the planes and developments made during the Cold War now stand in museums, relics of an age of spying that the world has moved on from, the RC-135 still has a place in the modern world. Because of its adaptability, while this may be an old plane, it's still got plenty of life in it yet. Now we mentioned the Strato Fortress in today's video. If you want to learn more about that plane, please do click on the video I'm linking to on the screen now. And as always, thank you for watching. Now, just before you leave today, maybe you're looking for something else to watch. Why not check out my new channel called War of Graphics? Want to know all of the details about some of history's most famous battles and wars? Come join me on War of Graphics from Sherman's March to the Sea to Operation Barbarossa. If it's got people fighting each other or occasionally animals, we will cover it. There is a link below.